grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I want to talk to you today about something that is probably the single most difficult topic of Scripture. That at least for me, I have found to be the most difficult topic to preach and teach on. And that topic is God's love. To be honest, I find it difficult to even articulate why it is I struggle with the concept of God's perfect love, but I know that I am by no means alone with that struggle. God's perfect love is something that I think we all find difficult to wrestle with. There's perhaps no other question I have seen both unbelievers and believers alike struggle with other than that question of God's perfect love existing in the world filled with sin and pain and suffering. Now let me be clear, I do not struggle with God's love because I don't believe in it. I don't struggle with it because I don't believe he is loving. I absolutely do believe that. And I don't think I or anyone else really struggles with the thought of God's perfect love because we don't have our own thoughts and ideas and opinions about what love is. I struggle with God's love because I don't have any real frame of reference or even the capacity to understand on my own what love is apart from what I believe love does. In other words, I think we all struggle with understanding absolute, perfect love as a noun, as a thing. Because we don't have it in and of ourselves. And we only have adjectives to describe with and verbs to serve as examples of what we believe love is. Allow me to try and illustrate my point this way. What is a shoe? This is a shoe. Right? That's a perfectly acceptable answer to that question, I hope. What is a book? Well, this is a book. A perfectly acceptable answer. What is a pen? This is a pen. Simple enough, right? Maybe not. Let's just take one letter out of that question. What is shoe? Not a shoe. What is shoe? What is book? Not a book. What is book? What's pen? Not a pen. What is love? You see, even with things that we think we do understand and that we don't really struggle with to understand, like shoes, books, and pens, we only understand those things by way of how we describe them and how we understand what they do, not necessarily the essence of what they are. And we do the same thing with love. I ask this question of any couple I counsel in marriage counseling, whether that's marriage or premarital counseling, I ask them that question right out of the gate. And we struggle with it for a while. And I, I let them squirm, at least for one or two sessions. Otherwise, it's not worth the time, right? What is love? How do you know you have it? Inevitably, the answers start to come and they have everything to do with what they think in their relationship they have seen or experienced or can describe that love does. And then I ask them this question. 
This time I'll ask you the same question, what is love? But now give me an answer without telling me what it does. Invariably, there is a long pause. In our text for today, the Apostle John goes to great lengths to define love. And to define it without confusing it with what love does or what from a human perspective we think love looks like. John gives us the definition twice in three words. God is love. What is love? Love is God. God is love. John doesn't say that God is loving. God is not describing the things that God does or says, although those are absolutely loving. God simp- John simply says that God is love. And that is why what he says and does is loving. It's a deeply profound statement in three very small words. And John goes to great lengths to stop us from shallowing the depth of this truth by trying to define it from human experience. John says in verse 7, love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In other words, John is saying pure love cannot be defined by anything you understand to be a human experience of love. Because love comes only from God. To use any sinful human experience to try and ultimately define what love is would be just that, sinful. It would be like trying to describe light with a shadow. To drive this point home even further, John says in verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. In other words, anything that we think we experience of true love, anything that will ultimately prove to be of true love, has nothing to do with you and me. And just in case we're still tempted to define our understanding of love with anything related to human emotion or experience, John says in verse 11, no one has ever even seen God. If we love one another... It's because God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. If God is love and no one has ever seen God and lived, then we have no way of defining love on our own. God's love must find a way to come to us. God must bring his love to us in a way that we can know it and that we can know him as sinful people who deserve only wrath and judgment. So how does God bring us that righteous love without destroying the people that don't deserve it in the first place? Christ. God has revealed who he is He has revealed himself. He has revealed his very love to us. The pure nature of himself in Christ. Verse 9 says, In this, the love of God was made manifest amongst us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. You have to understand that for John, who always talks about God being light, this pure, righteous light, if God were to have put his love in this world, unadulterated, unmitigated, we simply would not survive it. 
So he puts it in a little baby. So we would dare to come near. John would say that perfect love casts out fear. What is love? Where is it? Can you show it to me without telling me what it does? Yes. It's right there. It's lying there in a manger. I can show it to you. Pure love. The pure eternal love of God, John says, manifested in a baby. Of course, just because love has manifested itself and you can point to it doesn't necessarily mean you can understand it. And clearly you see that in the Christmas story by the many different reactions you have to this child laying in a manger. On the one hand, you have shepherds and wise men who bow their knees to this manifested love. And on the other hand, you have Herod who kills all of the infants of his own citizens in fear of this love. God would remain faithful, however, to his promise to provide a savior from sin and death, and he would not allow his son to be killed. He would preserve that Christ child so that he would grow up to be the sufficient sacrifice of love, the suffering servant of the God who is love, the God who would come to show us that love so we could understand it by dying for us. It's on top of Mount Calvary and in the empty tomb where we would finally be able not to just see the manifest love of God, but to begin to understand it. That's why John himself as an apostle would say in his gospel, it wasn't until after Jesus rose from the dead that we began to have any idea of what he was talking about the whole time. By the grace of God and the spirit of God, through faith in Christ, we understand God's love so that we would know God in Christ. And time and again throughout scripture, this is how we're told that we are to know and understand what true love is. By looking to the cross and believing in the love of God that's been made manifest there. You have the well-known scripture we read earlier from our gospel lesson in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then one chapter before our text today in John, 1 John chapter 4, the Apostle John says in chapter 316 of 1 John, by this we know, love, that Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. In Romans 5 verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says again, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And you can see this same truth of love manifest in Christ and what he has done and not anything within us going all the way back to our passage from Deuteronomy 7 when God first gave his law. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And it's not because anything about you. You were not many. As a matter of fact, you were the fewest on the earth. But you are God's people because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
It certainly is not popular in today's culture and society that insists everyone gets to define truth and therefore everyone gets to define love as they see fit according to their own opinions and preferences and selfish desires. But the truth and reality of love is that true love has nothing to do with you or me. It has everything to do with Christ. And as Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Christ is love. Not me, not you. We are sinful and loveless by nature. Without God in Christ, there is no love. This isn't just a truth that we need to pray that the world comes to know by the grace of God, but I would say ever increasingly more today, this is a truth that Christians need to remember every day. That love has nothing to do with you. And that's very good news. It has everything to do with him. And he has come and made it manifest to us. Nothing is more devastating to the Christian life than believing that you have love to give God and that God requires a certain love you have in order to give you his love in return. No. No, no, no. That's misunderstanding true love. And misunderstanding God's true love will only result in doubt, legalism. And both of those things stand in the way of God's love being perfected in us. Paul said in Romans, it was while you were still dead in sin. God loved you with everything he had. You want to love your spouse more? You want to love your neighbor more? You want to love anybody more? You want more love in your life in any way, shape, or form? Then abide in he who is love. And live through him, not yourself. This is why John says in our text for today, if we love one another, that's only because God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify, in other words, confess that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God so that we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to what I underlined there. If we love one another, this is an if-then if statement, right? If this, then this. If A, then B. If you love at all, it is only because God has abound in you. And how do we know? if God abides in us? That's the next if-then question, right? How do I know if God abides in us? Well, John says that right there. By this we know, because he has given us his spirit. And only by that spirit can you confess that Jesus Christ is God. In other words, do you confess that Christ is your Lord and Savior? Then God's love abides in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 puts it this way. Paul says, no one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except in that spirit, John says, 
That is how we know God's love abides in us. Not because I feel it today. Not because my love is what I think it should be. I know God's love is in me because it's only by his love that I can confess Christ at all. You see, faith, love, peace, hope, joy, this whole Advent season, all these topics, they're so complicated because we try and make them about us. And that's not the freedom that Christ promises to give. Faith, hope, love, peace, joy. I can show you where all of that's at. It's in him. It's his to give. And the good news is that he has given it to us. And that's only good news if you first confess that it's not about me. Because now you can receive all of it from him who has come. Where is true love? For all who believe in Christ, and because we believe in Christ, we can know that no matter what, that unchanging and eternal love of God that has perfectly loved us in Christ has been put right here. No matter what you go through, no matter what's happening, you have that love if Christ has you and if you have Christ. For it's only in God's love that you can have him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as your church, you have commissioned us to give good news. Good news of great joy, the angels said. That the Prince of Peace is here. That hope has been born. That the love of God has been made manifest. Lord, we don't have a hope of being effective in sharing that message if we don't understand those things first. In our sinfulness, Lord, we confess that we too often make those things all about us. Lord, in your mercy and by your spirit, help us to rejoice in the good news that all of those eternally wonderful things have nothing to do with us, what we understand, what we experience. If it were up to us, we'd never have them. But we do have them. Just as surely as your son has come and has died and has risen, we have love the love of God in our hearts. Lord, help that overflow out of us so that we may share the good news of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll continue now in our worship by collecting our tithes and offerings.
we stand with an offering of song. We pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to join hands if you'd like to receive the blessing and benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mm-hmm.